This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Vampire Once upon a time, when families only had one television in the house and no smartphones, the post-dinner, post-homework, pre-bedtime period of family life was spent sitting on the couch as a family watching situation comedies. Trust us, we're old enough to remember that time. And what a time it was. And at this time of the year back then, every sitcom and family show felt the need to supplant its normal programming to insert a special Halloween episode with a spooky story that didn't quite fit into the continuity of the series. The most famous of these zero-continuity Halloween specials were, of course, the Simpsons Treehouse of Horror episodes, a tradition that started 26 years ago in 1990. But in this modern era of streaming video services, podcasts, blogs, YouTube series, and other forms of alternative entertainment, there is no longer any need to give in to that silly sort of seasonal tripe. Especially for highbrow shows like ours, who are above that sort of thing. To be clear, our sudden hiatus on our ongoing discussion of the natural world's biomes has absolutely nothing to do with the time of year. We just need a break from biology and ecology. We want to talk about something different for one episode. How about just, you know, picking something at random, nothing to do with anything. Let's, uh, let's talk about vampires. See, Back in March of this year, Wizards of the Coast released a massive, published adventure path called Curse of Strahd. More than any other adventure path released for the current edition of Dungeons & Dragons, it got a lot of people talking. See, Curse of Strahd is not just some random adventure about a group of heroes getting a dinner invitation from a vampire lord and discovering they are his prisoners. Curse of Strahd is an update of one of the most well-known and arguably one of the most well-remembered adventure modules of the advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd edition era, Ravenloft. And the authors of Curse of Strahd even consulted with the authors of the original Ravenloft module. Ravenloft was an iconic adventure in several ways. It was written by the husband and wife duo, Laura and Tracy Hickman. And that's the same Tracy Hickman who went on to work with Margaret Weiss to write the Dragonlance setting and about a billion novels about said universe. See, at the time, D&D was growing up. Most D&D modules involved simple quests and wilderness exploration or dungeon crawls. It was all very encounter-based. Go out fight the monsters, overcome the obstacles, find the thing, rescue or steal said thing, bring it back, huzzah. But in the early to mid-80s, new modules started to appear featuring more complex, deeper plots with more well-developed characters. It isn't quite right to say the game became more focused on story, but the game's stories were becoming richer and more well-developed. Ravenloft was one of the first, and arguably one of the best. In Ravenloft, the heroes visit a small province called Barovia, a mist-shrouded land of simple, superstitious peasants that would fit right in anywhere in Eastern Europe. The heroes learn that the townsfolk must barricade themselves in nightly to protect themselves from the local aristocracy, Count Strahd von Zarovich, who dwells in Castle Ravenloft, an imposing gothic structure. Eventually, the party learns that Strahd is a vampire and that he has dark plans for the town or the PCs. Those plans? Well, it's complicated. See, the module made use of an interesting mechanic. It included a deck of cards modeled loosely on the idea of a tarot or fortune-telling deck that played into the setting quite well. The GM would draw a number of cards at the start of the adventure, which would determine the location of certain magic items, plot-related revelations, and Strahd's overall motivation. The most famous 
and most endearing of Strahd's motivations involved his obsession with a woman who resembled his long-lost dead love. Now, the deck of cards and changing nature of the adventure allowed Tracy and Laura Hickman to run this adventure for their friends every Halloween for several years before TSR finally published the module. Replayability was something that came up often in those days. It wasn't uncommon for groups to play the same adventures several times. Nowadays, that's not so big a feature. But what really made Ravenloft stand out was the villain, Strahd von Zarovich. See, the Hickmans had gotten tired of simple villains in RPGs. Moreover, they felt that vampires had become trite and cliched and overused. Everyone ran the adventure in which someone was sneaking around exsanguinating the locals, and then it turned out to be a secret vampire and the party had to hunt it down. In Ravenloft, Strahd was complex and his vampirism was, well, it wasn't exactly well known, but it wasn't a huge surprise. It was an open secret, and the revelation wasn't very important compared to everything else going on in this story. That made it really stand out. In doing so, the Hickmans basically redefined vampires for D&D. Because the archetype of noble vampire living in a castle and preying on his subjects became a very common trope after that. And that's kind of funny because that's exactly what happened back in 1897. Well, with one very important difference, which we'll soon get to. First of all, just in case any of our listeners are somehow unaware, a vampire is a supernatural creature. It is a dead human who has somehow returned from the dead and preys on the living. Normally, the vampire sustains its everlasting life by feeding on the blood of the living. Now, you might think there's a lot more to the definition than that. But if we try to attach any more, we run into trouble very quickly. Because vampires, and creatures like vampires, exist in almost every culture on Earth and have existed pretty much forever and the mythology surrounding them is a huge, chaotic mess. Or it was. Until 1897. But we'll get to that. Vampires are revenants. A revenant is a dead person who comes back to life to torment the living. Revenant comes from the Latin word meaning to return. Legends from ancient China, India, and Greece speak of the dead returning to terrorize the living if they died in unclean ways or weren't properly buried. In fact, there are so many legends about revenants in so many cultures that it would be impossible to catalog them all. But there are several factors that some historians feel help to give rise to some of the specific traits we associate with vampires. And many of those factors come down to a mixture of fear of death, superstition, and a poor understanding of illness and decomposition. For example, when a particularly hated individual died and was buried, the townsfolk tended to blame that individual for anything bad that happens shortly thereafter. A famine, plague, drought, or bad harvest? It's obviously the work of the dead dude getting revenge. In many places, especially in Europe, it became common to exhume the body of a supposedly guilty corpse to destroy it. In some places, particularly in Greece, Eastern Europe, and around the Mediterranean, soil quality could mess with decomposition. So, sometimes people would dig up a body and discover it hadn't decomposed very much. And that led to one conclusion the individual was still using the body. He was getting up at night and sneaking out and terrorizing people. This superstition became increasingly common when so-called wasting illnesses started to spread. A wasting illness is one that causes extreme malnutrition resulting in a loss of body mass. This resulted in the appearance of someone wasting away. It became common, when such an illness spread among a family, to dig up the body of the last healthy family member and destroy it. 
Obviously, that family member was coming back from the dead and feeding on the living. Many, many superstitions grew up around how to destroy the corpse of a revenant or vampire or how to prevent it from coming back. One of the most common was the practice of staking the corpse to the inside of the casket. Basically, you just drove a thick wooden nail or spike through its chest to pin it to the casket. Beheading, burning, and stuffing the mouthful of garlic were also very common. And of course, proper burial rites were a must. But today, accepting the weird sort of take on vampires that have infested teenage romance novels, vampires in pop culture are a pretty standard sort. They've become kind of homogenous, one might even say trite, and cliched. Aristocratic, classy blood drinkers, often lusty, and they have a standard slate of weaknesses. Sunlight, garlic, symbols of faith, stakes through the heart, more garlic, more bigger stakes, a lot more garlic just to be sure, and so on. And that's because, once upon a time, someone became obsessed with vampire superstition, picked out all the bits he liked, and wrote the definitive vampire. In 1897, Irish novelist Bram Stoker wrote Dracula. Dracula is a famous gothic horror novel that tells the story of a small group of Londoners who, under the direction of Professor Abraham von Helsing, do battle with a powerful vampire, Count Dracula. The story is told in epistle form. The novel is presented as a collection of letters, journals, diary entries, and other documents that recount the story. It begins with an English law clerk, Jonathan Harker, visiting the eponymous Count's Castle near the Romanian provinces of Bukovina and Transylvania. He's there to help the noble purchase property in London for his retirement. And gradually, he discovers he's a prisoner of the charismatic but thoroughly evil Count and his three vampire concubines. Thereafter, Dracula relocates to London, establishing several dozen lairs around the city, and he begins feeding on a woman named Lucy Westenra. This allows Mina Harker, the clerk's wife, Professor Van Helsing, the insane Renfield, and several others to discover Dracula's true nature. Mina eventually becomes a partial vampire, but ultimately, the group slays Dracula by stabbing him through the chest with a knife. Dracula has become an enduring horror figure. Basically, Dracula is the definition of the modern vampire. He's the Ur example. And just like Hickman's Strad von Zarovich, Dracula represented a departure from the vampires that came before. See, Stoker was obsessed with the superstitions of the Slavic people of Eastern Europe, who, we've mentioned before, were deeply superstitious. For several years, he studied everything he could about vampires and revenants and other spirits of the dead. But these were mostly what had been termed peasant superstitions. The typical vampire in those stories was a nasty dead person who was getting up at night to feed on the living, until the townsfolk dug up the corpse, destroyed it, and then threw the remains in the river. Stoker took these legends and made them about a powerful aristocrat whose evil was all but known to the folks who lived powerless under his thrall until a group of heroes could unravel the plot. Does that sound familiar? But what's interesting is that while the Hickmans were purposely trying to elevate the medium by changing simple peasant vampires into complex aristocratic villains, Stoker may have been trying to cash in on two popular literary movements. See, in the 1890s, two genres of fiction were becoming insanely popular. First was horror, especially gothic horror, and second was something called invasion literature, and both were based on fear. Invasion literature 
is a genre of fiction in which a foreign power invades another, often out of the blue. The first known example in 1871 was a short story called The Invasion of Dorking, in which mysterious foreigners of implied German descent invade a small English town. Such fiction was especially popular in England, where it was becoming clear that the invincible English Empire might not be so invincible. In the 1870s, Prussia invaded France and trounced what was widely considered to be the unbeatable French army. And of course, this was the period in which all of Europe was warming up to start World War I. The most famous example of invasion literature was H. G. Wells' story of alien invaders, War of the Worlds. Invasion literature played upon a fear of foreigners, and in Dracula, that fear of superstitious foreigners with strange ways dovetailed nicely with the fear of supernatural horrors. In that book, Dracula, a foreign count, surreptitiously invades London and begins preying on its people, and a ragtag band of heroes must stop him. Now, it is at this point that any other writer would round out their discussion of Dracula with the old chestnut about how Dracula is based on a real historical figure. But not us. Oh, we'll talk about Vlad. But first, we have to point out that no, Dracula was not based on a historical figure. Dracula was based on eight years of intensive research into Slavic folklore. It's just that late in his researches, Bram Stoker discovered the story of a particular Romanian nobleman and decided the name was pretty cool. And that name was Vlad Tepes III, a.k.a. Vlad Tepes Dracula, a.k.a. Vlad the Impaler. The story of Vlad the Impaler actually begins in the 10th century, when nomadic Turkish tribes were forced from their homes in the Asian steppes and settled in what we now call Turkey. There, many of them converted to Islam and became embroiled in the Islamic warrior tradition called the Gazi tradition. One tribe of Gazi warriors, led by a warlord named Osman, successfully conquered parts of Asia Minor and the Byzantine Empire, and thus began the Ottoman Empire. By the 14th century, the Byzantine Empire, which had grown out of the eastern half of the Holy Roman Empire, was severely weakened. The Ottoman Turks were expanding aggressively into Eastern Europe, and in 1453, the capital of Byzantium, Constantinople, was seized. Byzantium was over, and the Ottoman Empire was in power. During this period of aggressive expansion, the two sons of a Romanian noble were being held hostage by the Ottoman Sultan Murad II. See, Murad wanted to ensure that various Romanian provinces would stay loyal to the Ottoman Empire as they continued to push deeper into Europe toward Rome. Vlad II Dracul ruled the central Romanian province of Wallachia, and he was a member of an order of knights called the Dragon Knights. Dracul was simply an honorific that meant dragon. And his son was Dracula, son of the dragon. The Knights of the Dragon were specifically tasked with opposing the Ottoman Turks at the behest of the Holy Roman Empire. But with his sons as political hostages, Vlad Dracul was powerless against the Turks. This was exacerbated by the fact that the local noblemen of Wallachia opposed Vlad Dracul's rule and were attempting to oust him. In the end, Vlad Dracul was removed from power and ultimately killed. Meanwhile, his two sons, Vlad III and Radu, were raised very well. Political hostages usually were. They were raised alongside the Sultan's own son and educated like any young nobleman would have been. Radu found the imprisonment agreeable, befriending the Sultan's son and becoming somewhat faithful to the Ottoman Turks. But Vlad Dracula was not so amenable. He hated the imprisonment 
and when he was finally released and discovered his father and older brother had been unseated and killed, he became vengeful. At first, Vlad towed the line and gained support from Ottoman Turkish governors so that he could start to reclaim his land. After some hardships, he managed to reclaim his family's throne. And his first act was to stop the annual tribute that Wallachia had been paying to the Ottoman Turks. Vlad had a reputation for dealing violently with those who opposed him. Once he decided to stand against the Ottomans, he knew he had to unite the Wallachian nobles. It is said that he murdered many nobles who opposed him in cold blood. But his reputation for bloodthirsty savagery truly solidified when he began to fight off the Ottoman forces. Wallachia had very little military power, while the Ottoman military was powerful and well-armed. And so, Vlad adopted a number of terror tactics, the likes of which would make Batman proud. One night, for example, he had his own troops dress up as Ottomans and snuck into an Ottoman camp in an attempt to kill an Ottoman prince. The assassination attempt failed, but the Ottoman soldiers were in such a state of panic confusion that they started to slaughter each other, unsure of who the real soldiers were. And then, there was the time when he evacuated a town that was about to be invaded by Ottoman soldiers and left only gruesomely impaled Ottoman prisoners in the town square as a welcoming present. Unfortunately, these brutal tactics, while necessary, earned Vlad the nickname the Impaler, and the fact that he and his family had been very unpopular in Wallachia for years made it easy for the enemy to spread propaganda about Vlad Dracula. Pamphlets began to surface among Wallachian nobles and citizens talking about how Vlad would dip his bread in the blood of his enemies, or would bathe in their blood. Stories spread about merchants and nobles who were invited to dinner and impaled in the castle courtyard to bleed to death. And to this day, it is unclear what is true and what is rumor. In the end, though, European history does not remember Vlad Dracula as a monster. Ultimately, with drastically inferior numbers, using only strategy and fear, he was able to hold off one of the mightiest armies in the world. Pope Pius II recognized his victories and commended him, and he remains a national hero in Romania. In many ways, he was the hero Romania needed, not the one it deserved. Yes, we're saying it, there was more of Batman than Vampire Bat about Vlad the Impaler. And that's the story of Vlad the Impaler, and also the story about how vampires got reinvented twice. To some extent, there's nothing new in the universe, because if the story of the Hickmans reinventing vampires from D&D peasant stories into an aristocratic noble teaches us anything, it's that it's all been done before. But that's okay. It's great to try to do something new and different. But greatness comes from execution, not from innovation. Neither Strahd nor Dracula are remembered today because they attempted to redefine their genres or break down the mold. They are remembered because they were great characters. And when you use any of this in your own game, remember that. Just do what you think is great, and don't worry about whether it's been done before. And then, you can forgive us for giving in to the standard media cliché of the Halloween episode. This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com.